our second lunchtime lecture, and I'm very happy to welcome uh, Professor Robert Cowherd uh, to the stage, who's actually wandering around the, the lecture hall as we speak in a, a very interactive mode. Um, it's sort of awkward for me to give an introduction to someone who you all probably know better than I, so I'm not going to try to do that. Uh, we all know Robert. Um, I'm very happy to be a colleague of Robert. I also happen to uh, share a wall with Robert. We uh, fortunately have not put our books on the same wall, or that wall might have been destroyed at this point. If you've gone into his office, you know that he has an incredible wall of books, um, and I think brings to the department an incredible array of expertise and a uh, very, very interesting outlook on many different things. So with that very silly intro, please welcome Robert Cowherd, as he runs to the stage. Hold on. Sure. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for coming. One more, one, more, one more really quick thing. Again, with these lunchtime lectures, they're not a full hour. They're pretty quick. And so I'm really hoping that we get some conversation afterwards. And I know what Robert's going to be talking about is going to be provocative. And I'm certain you'll all have questions. And if you don't, I'm going to call on Ciro to ask a question. So, all right. Thanks. And uh, building directly upon that, uh, I could have just as easily constructed this talk out of your projects and the projects out of students that came before. Um, the, the central thesis of this project is, uh, was sparked by my dissertation research many, many years ago. However, it has evolved under the direct and powerful influence of the students who I've been, uh, had the, the privilege to collaborate with over the last seven years here at Wentworth. Um, and so those of you, uh, you are likely to see elements of your projects in these slides, and you are likely to hear the influence of your projects in what I say. Um, and forgive me for not uh, uh, citing you directly, but you have been a profound influence on, on what I'm presenting here. And so in a way, I'm just echoing back what you've taught me um, in, a, in a very significant way. So the, uh, the general topic here uh, is really the juxtaposition of two uh, realms that have been up until now kept, uh, kept mostly separate. One is the realm of uh, scholarship and research that deals with uh, the way humans experience space. Uh, it, it overlaps significantly with the philosophy of phenomenology, the uh, writings of many scholars who you have all um, read. Uh, and so that's one realm, is this deep, profound scholarly realm. And we're going to move directly to the work of Pierre Bourdieu, uh, the prominent French sociologist of the late 20th century. Uh, but on the other hand, there is another very equally and perhaps more well-known body of work, which is in the visual arts, uh, here uh, represented by Iwan Bond, the uh, prominent architectural photographer. Um, and so the project basically involves trying to bring these two worlds together. And in bringing these two worlds together, uh, I stumbled upon a new word. And I reluctantly uh, refer to this word because I typically am critical of new words. Uh, but the new word is sociography. And sociography is defined as the uh, spatial operation of social forces. And the promise and the challenge of this term, sociography, is to bring these two worlds together. The visual arts is not just an aesthetic project, but it is a profound humanitarian project. Similarly, the scholarly writings of people like Pierre Bourdieu and like-minded uh, scholars uh, is also, and perhaps more obviously, a profound question of how we understand the way we interact with each other in this world. And this world is a physical place. It is not a neutral physical place, but it exerts a powerful influence on how we think, how we behave, how we believe, and what things mean. And so uh, that is the challenge of this 
idea of sociography. So back to Iwan Bon and architectural photography. Iwan Bon has risen to stardom uh, in the world of architectural photography. No architect's name who you know has not been photographed by Iwan Bon. And just about every uh, famous recent photograph seems to come out of his camera. But he has done this at the same time as he has broken two unspoken cardinal rules, mostly unspoken, of architecture. Number one, get the people out of the picture. And number two, uh, don't allow the dirtiness of the city into the frame. Uh, Iwan Bon is more likely to cite Diane Arbus and other uh, portrait photographers than any prior architectural photographer as the primary influence. And he often says his main topic of focus of his photography are people. They just happen to be located in highly charged spaces. And so when he was photographing his famous recent publication uh, called Brasilia and Chandigarh, uh, he is, his primary focus are people and other sentient beings, in this case, uh, in these spaces, uh, acknowledging, un, uh, without saying so, that these spaces are completed by the people who occupy them, by the activities that occur within these spaces. Uh, this approach resonates with Serlio's Renaissance view of um, the city as a stage set. Uh, and I'm not going to show that slide. Um, there are many holes in this presentation uh, that I'm just going to gloss over very quickly uh, um, because of the time constraints. Um, Here's uh, Iwan Bond's photograph of Michael Maltzen's uh, center in Los Angeles. And uh, this is a clear, this is an unfamiliar view of iconic architecture uh, for reasons that we may or may not be uh, conscious of, but architecture typically does not welcome uh, being framed by the urban space that it occupies. Another photograph that I could be showing is a recent photograph published in Architecture Boston of uh, Diller Scofidio and Renfro's uh, ICA building in Boston, which emphasizes the desolate parking lot uh, context of this building, um, which dem would demonstrate the reason why we don't like to frame, don't like the urban frame to be the same as the uh, phot photographic frame of these iconic architectures. Another Iwan Bon photograph. Um, and so the allowing of the body back into the architectural frame is not just something that's been happening in architectural photography, but also in architectural drawing. And if you've ever been in one of my classes, or uh, if I've ever been on a jury, you've probably at some point heard me refer to the power of the human body in an architectural drawing. Um, uh, its ability to host us, we project our consciousness into the body momentarily. We experience the space from the perspective of that human body in the space. And then we come back to the crit room and we report on what we found. And uh, sometimes uh, anything that gives scale is capable of facilitating this transference, this empathy, this projection into the space. Uh, but it happens even better when the, those scalar indicators are, come in the form of furniture, so we can place, we can project our bodies in the furniture and occupy the space, or in actual bodies in space that allow us to momentarily project ourselves in occupying those bodies and experience the space as we construct it in our minds. And we're very good at doing that, it turns out. Um, now we move to Pierre Bourdieu and his uh, radical research that started out uh, conventionally enough, looking at the life of a village in North Africa. Um, the village was Kabylia uh, in Algeria, uh, a French colony, former French colony. And, uh, what he looked at was how women are treated and what the women experience in the space of the village. And there's not much to look at 
uh, none of these images are from Bourdieu himself. Uh, he conspicuously resisted the urge to spatialize what he was talking about, despite the fact that it was inherently a spatial architectural phenomenon. Uh, but here's a view of the village of Kabilia. And basically, his study identified that because of Islam and the practices of Islam, and the necessity, the requirement, the social requirement that women not be seen, that women stayed in the household until the men left for the field. And it's only when the women left, I mean, when the men left for the fields, that the women could come out of their houses and walk through the primary streets to gather water at the fountain. Um, this is one of the rare uh, illustrations that, or it's really more a diagram that Bourdieu gives us in his text. Um, but the, the women are more or less banned from the streets of Kabilia except when men are not there. When men are in the village, there is a secondary circulation path. So these hidden alleys behind the houses that are for women. And so there is a spatial segregation of paths for men and women. But there's also a temporal segregation that uh, behavior changes according to the different times of the day. And from this observation and from the spatial arrangement, Bourdieu made the brilliant leap to what has become his notion of habitus. Uh, habitus comes out of the idea of habitat, but habitat is more the uh, objective, factual understanding of space. Habitus goes beyond the objective, factual, spatial uh, configuration to those things that are a continuum between the, the form that we occupy and the mental structures that uh, structure the way we think. And so uh, a, a young woman, a, a girl born into this village, comes to understand because of the text of the village itself. The spatial structure of the village has embedded within its form the practice of women not being seen. And so it's not just a spatial form, it becomes a mental construct embedded in the mind of the girl as she grows older, uh, equally so for the men. Uh, the architecture of the houses are similarly restrictive in terms of views in reinforcing these social uh, constrictions. And so this idea of habitus has to do with the connections between the uh, physical form of space and architecture and the mental constructs, the mental structures that we carry within us. And he makes explicit through this study that there is a very direct connection between space and our, our cultural social structures. This is an extremely powerful idea that uh, belongs uh, in our, what we do as designers. Uh, we seem to intuitively know that it's true, but lack the vocabulary for articulating it. Um, we know it uh, right from the very beginning, uh, Vitruvius and the Vitruvian man. Uh, the human body is at the center of human experience. And the spatial configuration that encloses human experience uh, is directly related to. Our understanding of space has to do with the experience, our own personal experience of the human body. There's the additional uh, notion that I'm going to add to this, the interpretation of this familiar picture, and that is the issue of time. We know from our own experience that this is not two men superimposed at the same time. We know this, that this is a single man moving. So the, uh, because of our own embodied experience, we read this as being a time-lapse image. And this is um, where we get into the issue of the tools for understanding and taking the measure of how human bodies experience space. And this has been the focus of um, art theory, uh, landscape uh, painting uh, receives our projections, 
the haptic experience of space. This is a big slot that I'm going to skip over, but the history of art theory is filled with uh, theories of empathy, Einfühlung, uh, go back to um, uh, Wolfland in the German tradition, on to Schmarzo, uh, and through to today. Uh, there's been a great deal of, there's an entire literature about this idea of how the human body experiences space. And the general consensus is that humans don't, the body is not simply uh, a machine that collects sensory information and sends it to the head where the brain processes that information. That Cartesian separation between body and mind turns out to be not true that our perception of space is fundamentally implicated in the experience of the mind in the body. The body is not simply a vehicle that gets our brain to meetings. Uh, our brain and our bodies are inherently connected, and all human experience is, uh, is modulated through that and mediated through that bodily instrument. And so throughout the history of art, um, we see these depictions of the body moving in space over time. Um, and we get uh, to the Italian futurists who's, who had a deep in influence on art history of the 20th century. Uh, and this is another slot that I more or less skip over in this version of the work. Um, moving to uh, Holly White's time motion studies of observe, using cinematography to observe human behaviors in public space. Um, it takes on a technical uh, nature uh, where time motion studies become the basis for Taylorism, finding efficiencies in factory movement. The control of the body becomes a fundamental a uh, technical thing for business and com commerce and capitalism to, to take command over, to increase efficiencies, um, becomes the object of aesthetic uh, in advertising. Uh, a recent uh, collaboration between David Rockwell and uh, a Broadway choreographer um, took a look at uh, significant public spaces in New York and basically started to diagram the choreography of how bodies move in space and what it might mean. And these studies were uh, preliminary to the design of a new air terminal uh, in New York. Um, the photographer, um, Tratyanko, uh, works on what many of us have started to call body clouds, uh, because when we take uh, when we overlap and try to capture the movement of bodies in space, it seems to generate these clouds of human bodies. Um, it was used in the research uh, in looking at the social operation of space, looking at the difference between neighborhoods with heavy traffic and light traffic, uh, and the significant influence it imposes on social connections. Um, Here's a view of the uh, Italian futurists. Uh, this is a common theme in the painting, sculpture, and manifestos of Italian futurism that had a profound impact on the history of how this unfolded in the 20th century. And they identified it as a political issue, that the human body and the control of the human body has a lot to do with power. As a matter of fact, some people would say that the human body as actually the source and the point of origin of all human rights. That even the, the command and power of uh, the military of, an, of a nation can be confronted with a single human body, uh, which reinforces this point of the political aspect of the human body occupying space. And so is there a way to take the measure of how this works and have it influence the way we deal uh, with the human body in architectural terms. Uh, we speak of agency in architecture, but really, um, as Erblin's project helps us understand, 
it is not a matter of the agency of architecture. It is the agency that is of human bodies that is amplified by architecture. And so there's something about the moving image that fails to capture with sufficient simultaneity the power of the human body in space. And so uh, many attempts of recent years have been more of the time-lapse photography um, element. But there have been some, this is one uh, from Schindler's List, where he tracks the course of a single body uh, by using a black and white frame. Uh, and then it's hard to tell from this low resolution view. But you'll recall from when you saw the movie that this girl is wearing a red coat. And so she pops out uh, from the urban context. And uh, there's also the use of this elevated vantage point, which comes to us uh, from the 19th century tradition of urban depictions, where there is a foreground of human spatial experience and a background that allows us to understand the larger spatial operation of the city. And so the human bodies in the foreground and uh, the, the urban structure in the background becomes this dramatic stage upon which uh, human interplay uh, unfolds. And uh, so through this cinematic uh, use of sociographic techniques, um, we get this dramatic uh, embodiment of the horror of the Holocaust. And here we see the still view of uh, what we recognize as the red coat uh, being carted away. And it becomes a central icon of the advertisement of the film. Um, other attempts to capture the simultaneity of motion uh, in the city brings us to the photography of Martin Romers, who is currently on a grant to uh, capture this interplay in urban space between moving bodies, whether they are uh, clothed only in fabric or if they are clothed in steel and glass uh, armored vehicles. And once again, we get this uh, elevated perspective that allows us to see the, human, the interplay of human bodies in the foreground and the larger urban system uh, that structures that interplay. And so we start to take the measure of how the spatial framing exerts an influence on this human interplay, the drama that unfolds in the foreground of these photographs. And um, students uh, have begun to experiment with some of these techniques in their own work, um, some work that is preliminary to architectural. Um, this is a student. Uh, working with some of these similar um, challenges of how do you capture the space that the body occupies uh, throughout time. This is from Jamie Montana in 2007, trying to use digital tools to capture the, the traces of human motion in juxtaposition with vehicular motion. Um, this is Julie Scheel, also from an earlier time. Um, similar to some of the projects we see in the thesis studio. She was using the tracking of the human body as a means of generating form and possible meanings. This is the work of the uh, choreographer, painter, and visual artist uh, Neil, uh, Nell Breyer, who uh, is associated with the Media Lab. She's been doing performance art that is embodies uh, in, incorporates both uh, choreography in public spaces and the capturing of it on video. And some of her work um, offers um, some very interesting cues as to what we might do uh, to take, uh, take the measure of how bodies operate in space. Capturing uh, through stills. Uh, again, we seem to be attracted to Grand Central Terminal because of this uh, dynamic interplay of human bodies in this specific spatial frame. 
the Boston Common is also a, a focal point of hers. That's back at Grand Central Terminal. Uh, and some of my own work trying to test uh, the limits and capacities of some of these techniques using time-lapse photography. Um, and in my own study, this is um, similar to Tiananmen Square. There's something about uh, the critical mass bicycle rallies that occur in cities all over the world, uh, where at the last Friday of every month, bicyclists take to the streets and they occupy the streets moving slowly, saying, uh, as a, by using their bodies in space to proclaim their rights to public space. And then the counterclaim by the automobile, in this case, in, um, in Porto Alegre. And then my attempt to use stills from the, uh, the crude video to try to capture it with the simultaneity and power of some of the Italian futurists. Um, and this resonates, and I'm getting to the last few images. Um, another choreographer who's been working with this is William Forsyth, who uh, partnered with uh, the Computer Science Laboratory at uh, Ohio State University to uh, develop uh, significant uh, tools, a body of tools uh, for capturing um, both in a notational system that you see below that tracks in real time as the dance unfolds in the frame above in a perspectival view. Um, sorry, the resolution is low. This one is a little bit better where there's a simultaneity of the perspective view, the plan view, and then the notation below of uh, the choreography. And uh, that notation below is enhanced by uh, notations that the choreographer adds to the view above. Uh, significant moments, he marks them with graphic uh, additions to the view. And um, there's a strong suspicion that these techniques um, that explicitly deal with the relationship between the human body and the spatial architectural frame hold some promise for a deeper understanding of what we do. Uh, so far from uh, eliminating the body from the architectural frame, the body is implicated in much more profound ways, not simply in understanding the way architecture operates after the fact, but in having a more profound understanding of how uh, architecture might be generated uh, in the architectural studio in ways that uh, acknowledge how these things operate in real time in space. And then in the final slide, um, this collaboration has generated uh, a very rich collection of still images that attempt to capture human motion in space uh, that combines uh, aspects of digital representation and uh, video photography and and the manipulation of these views uh, with computers. Uh, and so just in closing, um, I think the challenge for anyone uh, exploring and entering into these issues is to bring together the aesthetic uh, appreciation of the human body in space with the rich literature of theory, uh, and I think most significantly perhaps Pierre Bourdieu, but certainly not limited to his writing. Uh, of understanding how these relationships are not simply aesthetic. Uh, they are constantly aesthetic, and we receive them, we experience them as aesthetic um, experiences, but they uh, are aesthetic in the more profound sense that encompasses other cultural phenomena, uh, including economic power, social forces, uh, how we construct meaning, how meanings are reproduced for children uh, across the generations, and how uh, politics unfolds, uh, how space, and this is the thing that really uh, kind of anchors my research, how space is anything but neutral. It is an instrument of political uh, power. 
uh, and uh, the some operators seem to uh, understand this in a profound way and it's time for the rest of us to catch on so that it can be um, uh, so it can be dealt with more directly and not just happen as if it's natural um, so thank you for your attention and attending and I hope uh, you have some questions Zero. So I, uh, I'm going to try to capture that um, for everyone. Um, first noting the, it's very interesting, the, the raised vantage point, uh, but also uh, the question being, uh, how do we collect the data necessary to understand how social cultural forces operate and make it available to, uh, to the design process? Is that a fair? Um, well, I think, uh, the first step is to recognize the extent to which we already do that. The structure of this space is very much uh, informed by a power relationship between student and teacher. And every classroom, in a way, is the embodiment of this socio-cultural power differentiation that is, does not, it doesn't mean that it's automatically suspect far from it. Um, it is uh, something we, it's part of a social contract that we enter into willingly and we consider it to be a natural arrangement that is the prerequisite for teaching and learning. Um, uh, at the same time, I think as soon as you look at it deliberately and directly, and as Bourdieu would say, uh, pay attention to those things that go without saying. Those things that go without saying, as soon as you say them, uh, alternatives inevitably emerge. And so it's, only, it's with the retooling of the classroom with digital means, all of a sudden it, it threatens to destabilize the, the uh, otherwise stable power relationship between teacher and student. And it's no longer about the sage on the stage filling up the en empty vessels of the student bodies in the audience and it becomes more about a joint collaborative relationship which uh, many of us enjoy in the context of architecture school where it feels more like a, a collaborative research project that we're all promoting and pushing forward and in a very real way the spatial structure of the studio in which the teacher is the uh, outsider entering into the space that the power is is with the students um, which is reinforced to me whenever I can't remember the code to the door <laughs> that um, you know I'm I, I learn spatially in my bodily experience every day that I am number four and you guys are the lead uh, investigators in these things and uh, we support as best we can from below, but you're at the cutting edge, and we follow along as best we can and support to the extent we're able. And so just the different spatial, uh, just being aware of how these spatial constructs work between Blount Auditorium and the architecture studio, um, all of a sudden opens your eyes to seeing the whole world this way, crosswalks, uh, everything.
maybe the other model of the, um, the man in Tiananmen Square who stops the train for the tanks. Okay? So one of them is a kind of, might lead to a kind of uber functionalism, this idea of like mapping how movement so that the architecture might respond to it in a kind of performative, perhaps functionalist manner. Who takes it? It's always other people's done this stuff. How, or, or maybe I can are there political implications to something like this? And do you know of projects that have actively proposed something? Because this seems to me like it's a kind of watching. Like we, we watch what's happening, it's a, it's a collection of information. Whereas the Tiananmen Square needs that political context for the action to mean something. Right? And so do you know if there's a kind of mapping of these two together? Could you is there are there architects working in this manner that are kind of collapsing both the sort of physical mapping of space and the political in a projection, in a project? So, like, I don't know if this makes sense, and if you have to sort of work this out as they go along, but, you know, Greg Lynn's work, for example, with all the blogs and things like this, follows this sort of stuff as a form making tool. But the work really doesn't stand on its own, or the work stands on its own, on its own in different ways. It doesn't need that form finding tool. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, and it seems like the political is really the, the, the edge here. So is there a way to map this stuff? Well, I, I have a counterexample. Okay. So, this I often, if you can't prove something, prove the opposite. Um, so, my counterexample, how come I, I can't remember his name? Shmi, Sh no, the architect who did the functionalist stuff at Weisenhof, the, the barn where the cow, the path of the cow is, right, right. the functionalist. Yeah. You know the guy. Shim K. I don't know. He's he's famous for being highly functional. So here's the famous You tell it to the Frankfurt kitchen. Um, well, the thing that that makes this barn more dramatic, and I could find it, I suspect, but I'm not going to, um, is how wrong it seems. So the cow walks in the barn and it walks on an arc. And so tracing the, the, the bodily motion of the cow as a way of generating form is fundamentally inadequate. Uh, it's, it strikes one as being completely wrong. And any time uh, people have speculated, well, this is the way the body moves, why not create the envelope that, um, that matches the bodily motion? So if you translated this directly into an architectural form, uh, the outcome is obviously inadequate uh, to the standards and criteria of architecture. So that is definitely not the point. Uh, the more, and this is not a shortcut to the generation of form. And the, one of the most significant crises faced by the world of parametric design is none of this makes our jobs easier. If anything, it makes our jobs harder. Um, but the hard, it's a good kind of hard. Uh, by having access to a larger vocabulary of form, it increases the options uh, that are no longer limited by the uh, economies of orthogonal boxes. Um, at the same time, it makes all the more crucial the critical act of the designer. And so the ability of the designer to draw something, to represent form, to represent the human experience of space and architectural form becomes all the more crucial. And so it is a fundamentally critical tool of evaluating the performance and uh, the operation of architecture. Uh, that's where the rubber hits the road. Uh, that's what's important, is to be more critical of our spaces and not accept uh, the natural, these things, these relationships of space as being natural in any way. Uh, does that make sense? That it's a, it becomes a critical tool of evaluation in the process of design and in a way it elongates, it, it makes it um, more, more important than ever before for us to take the measure of how humans 
uh, occupy space, experience space, move through space, how social forces operate within these spatial frames uh, than ever before. And it makes them available, these tools promise to make available the critical tools to evaluate how this works and not just leave it no longer you know, be liberated from the delusion that these spatial framings are neutral in any way. They're not neutral. They structure the way we operate in space and add into that the idea of habitus. It structures our internal existence. It structures the way we think. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I think the natural tendency is to start with the individual experience of space. Uh, and that's kind of um, an American tradition of the rugged individual, and uh, we can only project ourselves into one body at a time. But uh, very quickly, uh, I think we come to recognize that uh, we very rarely operate as individuals alone in space, that um, uh, it's, it's really a collective experience. Every time a body enters a space, it alters that space. It alters the spatial field. Robin Evans has written uh, quite effectively about this. And uh, every time a new body is added, it shifts. And so uh, it's more about um, social forces beyond the individual. Although the individual has a similar relationship to space, it's just that that relationship is less interesting, I would say, because architecture has a profound capacity to structure our social relationships this is where uh, the political uh, uh, becomes more uh, to the fore. Yes, Chris. Well, I think it depends, and uh, I think there are uh, some, some bodily occupations last a long time, um, and others are more ephemeral. That, um, you know, this bodily occupation is a very long-lasting bodily occupation, uh, and it echoes across his historical time. Um, other more mundane and banal uh, spatial occupations um, pass quite quickly. Um, so. So it, it happens and it's gone. Uh, when we take a photograph of Ruggles Avenue, uh, it looks empty. But how many of us step off that curb on our way to the T station uh, without a certain healthy degree of trepidation and fear? It's because uh, there is a long lasting time lag of cars traveling at 40 miles an hour that sticks with us. And so it's as if the space is occupied, even when it's uh, technically, factually, and objectively empty of traffic. There is that uh, trace and that decay uh, and that presence of the car that passed by uh, a minute ago last week when I almost got hit, or uh, three years ago when uh, I saw someone get, you know, it's, it's that, it echoes. 
Um, and so I, how do you capture that? A still photograph does not suffice. There is a solidity to that wall that we experience at the curb line, that we internalize this, that, that right to the space of the street, and we say, I'm a pedestrian, I have no right to that space of the street, or that my right to the space of the street, although legally I have just as much right to that space as a car, culturally, it's constructed by social experience. Mentally, I have no right unless there's no car needing that space at that moment. And that manifests in things like the case in Wellesley, where if ever there was a case of a bicyclist being murdered by a car driver, this was the case. There were witnesses, there were videos, the person was, you know, middle-aged woman with high standing in society, uh, video, everything, the driver it was hit and run, uh, clearly self-incrimination uh, indications of guilt, and yet the jury said, no crime occurred. Uh, so these, these mental constructs are profound and deep and embedded. And how do you capture that? You know, this, even the time lapse of the car doesn't suffice. It would have to be a much more solid wall to truly capture and take the measure of the spatial social condition of this construct. Peter. Um, so the question is, um, taking the opposite uh, approach, what is so uh, enticing about the photography of someone like Ezra Stoller? Um, does that capture it? Uh, I don't know if it's enticing. It's like, what is it, what, why is it you want to make representation of that? Well, the short answer uh, is it's gorgeous and powerful. Uh, this, this reading of space and architecture does not uh, contradict and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't deny the reality that we love voluptuous space. Uh, just, and I think the best example of that is the opening, um, is perhaps the Iwan Ban photography um, things like this. Um, this is sculpturally uh, profound, like gorgeous, and the space itself is sculptural, and you know it's it's a very powerful space. Uh, and so these things are not mutually exclusive. And Ezra Stoller was the pioneer of framing uh, an architectural form and space. Um, sometimes with people, sometimes without, in a way that uh, really conveyed the power of what architecture can be and what it can do. Um, and so, in a way, it's an additive interpretive analysis. Architectural space does operate in this way, but it, it doesn't stop there. It also operates in these uh, other ways over time and in conjunction with the way bodies uh, occupy the space and what is produced, not by the architecture alone, but by the uh, continuum of architectural space and everything else. Uh, so going to back to the village of Kabylia, if there was no such thing as Islam in Kabylia, you could have a similar spatial arrangement but it would mean something different. It would operate differently. And the internal structures of the young women of Kabylia would be completely different. And so architecture as a component of something else is what we're talking about here.